All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back to No Who Drives Return from Boardroom Alpha. Uh, today, we're going to be talking boards of directors, universal proxies, governance, uh, and much more with Anthony Goodman, uh, who's a senior partner and the head of Corn Ferry's board effectiveness practice. Anthony, uh, really good to see you again. And thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, David. Awesome. So how about, you know, a minute or two on, uh, on your background? Who's Anthony? Where does he come from? Haha, <laughs> well, originally he comes from the UK. Okay, yeah. He's been in the US now about 23 years. Uh, you know, when I got off the metaphorical boat, because uh, <laughs> it was really a plane, I was told, uh, you know, you need to keep your accent because it puts at least 50 points on your IQ. And you know, <laughs> I need all the help I can get, David. Um, well, I've been in been uh, involved in the board space now for more than 20 years. Uh, I head up, as you say, the board effectiveness practice at Corn Ferry, which is the group that does board evaluations, board succession planning, and other forms of consulting with boards. Prior to that, I was with a competitor a search firm in a similar role. And prior to that, I was with a group that brought board directors together to share best practices with each other. So um, had a lot of experience listening to board directors talk about what works and what doesn't, and now have the ability to bring uh, that understanding of best practice uh, to uh, boards directly. Uh, so to kick it off, you, know, you recently published um, in conjunction with, with Gibson Dunn, um, you know, an updated report on, on, on what's called uh, company board evaluation. So, you know, first, can you tell us a little bit exactly what, what that means and what went, in, what went into that report? Yeah, so um, public company boards are generally under an obligation to conduct a self-evaluation every year of the board and the committees. Um, the New York Stock Exchange has it as a listing requirement. Um, and what we were interested to understand is, well, what do they actually do? Because mm -hmm. there's a vast spectrum of practice from kind of very little all the way through to quite sophisticated. So we took a look at particularly the S&P 500, we thought would be interesting because you would expect to see more of the leading practices there, as you know, with public companies in the US as you move down the long tail of small cap yeah. companies practice gets a little grayer in terms of best practice or minimum practice. Uh, so we, we took a look at the S&P 500 and um, we looked at their disclosures. So in other words, what did they tell their investors they were doing um, to evaluate the board? Now, of course, not everybody discloses a lot of the detail. There ended up being about 440 companies that disclosed in enough detail for us to be able to look and analyze uh, what they were really doing. Mm. Um, and so we, we wanted to sort of dig into that. And I guess the headlines, David, that we, we were quite pleased with three things we saw in there and we were disappointed with one. So the three things we were pleased by, one is that 60% uh, now are reviewing not just the board and the committees, but also individual directors, which I think is important. Um, we'll come back and talk about that, I'm sure. Secondly, uh, more than half of them now are using interviews as a sort of methodology for how they're conducting their self-evaluation. Why is that important? Well, if you simply rely on a survey, which a lot of companies do, uh, our belief is you, you're not really going to get at root causes. You're probably not even going to get very candid replies because people are concerned about putting things in writing and creating a record. Um, and so interviews are typically much, much better because you can ask follow up questions, which you can't when it's a survey. Um, and then the third thing that pleased us, and you, you'd say, well, you would say that, wouldn't you, is about a third of them were using an external um, consultant of some form to actually conduct the evaluation, either annually or periodically. Um, and we're going to look into that in more detail in future years, just to try and understand what's the frequency that they're doing this, the norm that sort of got established coming out of the UK and, and French corporate governance codes was every 
two to three years, which is really every three years um, as it's emerged. And, um, and so we're keeping an eye on that thing. Now, what was the disappointment to us? With all of this activity going on in terms of the board evaluation, only, well, less than 25% actually disclosed any of the changes they made as a result of the evaluation. And yet we know that the large institutional investors, the asset managers would love to know more about what happens in the evaluation because they see it as how serious is the board about continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And if all they read is that you did some interviews and you looked at boards, committees and individuals and every couple of years you use a third party, well, it tells them, okay, you're using some useful tools and techniques, but I have no sense of whether that produced any lasting change. And what did you change? Did you change your agenda? Right. Did you change your committee? You know, did you change any of the people? You know, tell me, tell me what came out of it, right. um, how you're doing. Yeah, so you said that in, in one of your write-ups that there's a missed opportunity there uh, for companies to, you know, share that color. Do you think this is just a continued theme of, you know, we're going to disclose as little as we need to until we get investor pressure behind it? Or, you know, what what what, what, what are they hiding? <laughs> well, a lot of companies have to be dragged kicking and screaming to the disclosure table, don't they? Um, usually with their lawyers holding them uh, one way or the other. So, um, yeah, unless the SEC tells them to do it, unless the investors say they want it, um, it seems that it, it's it's hard uh, to get more disclosure. But I think that is a missed opportunity because here's an opportunity to establish a narrative about how seriously your board takes the work of the board, having the right people there, spending time on the right topics, making sure that it's the they've got the right committees looking at the right things. And you could explain that. Uh, you know, and how you've used the self-evaluation to improve what you're doing year on year. And I would think that investors would be encouraged by that kind of information. And like, what do you, what is there to hide? In right. other jurisdictions, this happens and it's pretty typical. Like I mentioned the UK and France earlier. You can go into most annual reports of companies from the UK or France, and you can read uh, what happened in their valuation, the same in the Nordics. Um, so in Europe, they've managed to survive this okay. And I, I think the U US companies would be fine. Uh, yeah, and it seems to be, you know, in light of some recent current events, you know, board quality, oversight, governance are all, you know, topics um, that are on top of mind for, for investors and all stakeholders alike. So you'd think that, um, you know, more concrete takeaways from from those valuations would be of, of use to, to investors. Um, and so you talk about you know changes that they can make. You know, when we look at overall, you know, board compositions, um, you know, what are some challenges that that current boards are facing today, whether that's from you know a DI perspective or you know, if you're thinking about the next board member who's next, what are what are some challenges that our boards are facing? Well look, we can um, we can look at uh the push towards diversity, and we can look at specific skill sets that have become uh, increasingly the focus of what of what boards are looking for. But actually, I think the big challenge is there's too little turnover uh, in boards. Um, we're getting the retirement age where they have them going up uh, to 75 now, being the most popular number. You know, 10 years ago, it was 70, and I'm sure it was probably lower than that before <laughs> that. So, you know, we're not, retirement ages are being pushed up to keep people on the board longer. Only 6% of public companies have a term limit, although I suspect that may become more important as uh, as we go forward here. But that's just my personal opinion. Right. Um, and you know, they're not doing, for the most part, many of them are not doing individual director assessments. So only 60% of the S&P 500 would translate to, I would think, a lot less than half and yeah. way, way less when you head down into the Russell 3000. Right. So, um, you know, so they're not creating turnover. They're not assessing who's on the board and deciding 
if their skill sets are still current and useful given changes in the strategy. They're not thinking, you know, I often use this baseball analogy that in baseball you have value of replacement player, yeah. ball, right? Um, the same thing could be applied to board seats, right? Which is so you may have a great person on the board. I was going to say guy. It is actually usually a guy. But you may have a great guy on the board who's been there and everybody loves them. But, you know, they haven't been a sitting executive in 15 years or more. Mm -hmm. And you've got to think about well, what's the value of that seat? Yes, of course, institutional memory is important. But maybe there's someone else on the board who has that as well. And what is the value if you were to bring in a replacement director who might, for instance, give you digital transformation experience, which you absolutely need in this day and age, or would bring you important um, demographic diversity, or brings an international perspective to the board and, and a sort of a current international perspective. So to me, that's the real question that I think a lot of boards shy away from. And, you know, when we ask boards about their board culture, they always, the first word that comes out of every director's mouth is collegial. Mm -hmm. Our board is very collegial. Well, I think collegiality is often used as a, it's almost like the trump card that you play yeah. that stops yeah. conversations, difficult conversations, yeah. about whether someone should stay on the board from happening. Right, it almost seems like you know, they're set in complacency until you know there's an agitating factor to to ruffle the feathers a little bit, right? Um, it's it's the old um, you know the CEO appoints you know yes men and women to the board rather than someone that you know will make challenging questions and 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 foster debate. Well, I think that's got a lot better in the right. you know it's not the CEO appointing anyone these days; it is the board appointing. The board but, you know, when the board's thinking about, uh, you know, they might talk about chemistry, you know, is this, is this person going to fit into our board culture? Quite often that means is this person going to agree with us and not rock the boat too much? Um, and that may be the wrong way of thinking about this because, you know, when you have an oyster, you don't get a pearl unless you get some grit in there. And I suspect there's a little bit of that with boards that you do need some licensed dissent going on in the boardroom um, in order to have a creative conversation about taking the company forward. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know, when we talk to management teams, you know, when we're actually in there doing board evaluations, man the biggest complaint we get from management is, is um, that the board is not providing any stretch or any valuable guidance to them. It's not what you would, you know, tend to think, oh, you know, the board tells us what to do. No, it's the board has no opinion. Mm -hmm. The board does not understand the business well enough to challenge us about whether our goals are really stretching or not. Mm -hmm. um, and that, again, talk about missed opportunity. Yeah. I mean, that's a missed opportunity because, in effect, management's running the company with very little input from the board in that scenario. Right. And that's that doesn't help anyone. Um, and so, you know, you, you mentioned this earlier. Um, so we're doing, you know, overall board evaluations, but you mentioned that, um, you know, individual board member evaluations are, are becoming more important than ever. You know, A, from a board effectiveness standpoint, B, you know, also in light of the new universal proxy rules, whereby, you know, activists and, and investors alike can can vote on you know individual board members. So, you know, how should boards be thinking about that aspect of now there's going to be you know more scrutiny on perhaps you know individual you know members of a board? Well, we, we've always advised boards to think about being their own activist, right? In activity, <laughs> when we've said things like that, we've been talking about strategy. So, you know, look at your own strategy through the lens of an activist and how would they pick it apart? What's the what's the letter they would send you about yeah. your own strategy? Now, you could apply the same thinking to the board composition, which is what are they going to say about your directors when they're trying to persuade the institutional investors to support their candidates rather than yours? Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be better if you had conducted that analysis on your own board 
before they've done it for you and before they've captured the narrative. You know, most activists don't launch campaigns unless they're fairly sure they're going to get some institutional backing because at the end of the day, they want to win. Um, and so it would be useful to look at your board through the lens that a BlackRock or a Vanguard or a State Street or whoever is going gonna, is gonna to look at your board. And I think individual director assessment can help with that because not only would you look at skills and experiences and whether they're still relevant given changes to your strategy, but you would also look at behavior. Now, that's the bit that no one knows about. That's not uh, something investors know about. It's not something the activists can really talk about. They can talk collectively, but not individually. Mm -hmm. But you know whether someone's sitting at the table and not saying anything or whether they're sitting at the table and talking too much and talking right. over body right and you can do something about that and you can help your board be much more effective and understand who are the a players and who are the b players and if they're going to target our b players maybe we should be a bit more proactive in thinking about a planned succession planning process an intentional process over time over two three years where we might ask some of those B players to move on in order that we can bring in some of the skills and experiences that we need. Mm -hmm. So more proactivity from boards to you know, get ahead of, of, of some of those things. I think so. You know, typically the renomination process, it, it can be pretty rote in a lot of companies. You know, yeah, we took a look at everybody and yeah, they were all great. Um, this is an opportunity to dig deeper and to really understand what somebody is contributing, both in terms of skills and experience and in terms of their behavior and mm -hmm. yeah, at their role in part of it. You know, boards are a team. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're a weird team and they would never <laughs> use the word team to describe themselves, but they are. And there are certain norms about how teams operate effectively that do apply to a group of eight or 10 human beings sitting around a table trying to make some decisions. Um, we tend to view, view it similarly. And so you mentioned, it's interesting. So, you know, obviously you can evaluate an individual board member on their behavior on your board. How important um, do you think that, you know, a, a board member's other uh, business interests um, are in, in evaluating in, in, you know, their, their, their value, right? So if, say they sit on two or three other boards, um, you know, we're of the mindset at, at our company that you should be looking at, you know, the performance and, and the goings on of the other companies that, you know, a given board member might might be sitting at. Do you think companies are, you know, doing a good enough job paying attention to that aspect? No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they necessarily look at um, the broad swathe of, of things that that person has been involved in. I, I was recently involved with a company that, did want to do that they thought that they might be vulnerable to an activist at some point and they wanted to take a look at you know let's just take tsr as a um proxy here for for shareholder return yep. and um let's understand um, uh, among our board uh you know who's created and who's destroyed shareholder value in their role if they were a ceo mm -hmm. you know in their in their time as ceo and in terms of the time they've been on the boards of their different companies. And it's it's an interesting picture. And, yep. you know, frankly, it was pretty muddied picture because some people, you know, had created value in one board, but not in another. And sometimes, you know, there were issues to do with the industry that they were in. And mm -hmm. obviously we were looking at it relative to the, in, uh, you know, the index. Um, but that's quite rare that the boards go to that length unless they've actually in the middle of a proxy yeah. fight or they know one is coming because and then they know they need to do that analysis but i so i think it's interesting um you know i get worried when i look at boards and the board directors are only on that board and not on any other board because Where's the cross-pollination of ideas and best practices from one board to another? I think there's value in having directors who've got some experience. Now, of course, we have a lot of first-time board directors who are only on one board who are current executives, and 
that's fine. They're bringing something else to the table, which is what a current executive thinks about these issues. Um, but for those who are retired and doing multiple boards, I, I think there's value to be had, you know, as long as you don't get overboarded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost a little chicken and egg there. Get You, know, you need some new, fresh ideas, um, but not necessarily everyone has CEO experience or you, know, you always hear you, you want prior board experience, but you can't have prior board experience. So till you get that first one in there, um, but totally take your point to, you know, to see people only on one board versus, you know, get, getting, you know, additional board seats down the line. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, you use the word balanced and I think that's important as an idea we were talking with a group of, of nominating and governance committee chairs recently about this issue, and they were quite enamored of this idea of average tenure as being a way of managing departures from the board, uh, something that Microsoft came up with a few years ago. And I think that the average tenure there has to be 10 years, uh, which means that you can have a balance of longer tenured institutional memory directors, uh, but you've got to also have some new people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's an interesting regulation uh, way of sort of getting fresh blood on the board without necessarily losing some quite valuable long tenured experience as well. Um, that that may be something that more board should take a look at because I think that balance is valuable. Right, right. Um, do you expect to see an uptake in activist situations given the universal proxy changes? Uh, well, I, I I listened to Bruce uh, Goldfarb <laughs> <laughs> on your uh, podcast recently, and uh, look, I, I think that um, it this is basically making it more convenient for institutional investors to pick and choose candidates when there is a contest. Uh, and you could argue that that's broadly neutral. It might save the activists some money, yeah. but the real winner here is the institutional investor who now gets to more easily decide, well, I like these people on the management or company slate and these people uh, on the activist slate. Mm -hmm. and not have the inconveniences that were there before. I think, you know, I was trying to think through scenarios where someone might use this. I was thinking, well, if you're one of the, um, I think it's 184 companies left in the Russell 3000 with no women directors. Shocking that's still that high. <laughs> yeah, I mean, still 184 out there as of the end of 2021. Um, you know, might an activist cleverly in put up a slate of a couple of women uh, candidates, well-qualified women candidates, knowing that all the large institutions have very strong policies about gender diversity on the board? Mm -hmm. And in a scenario like that, you know, maybe you're much more likely to to win because those companies have all been under notice mm -hmm. for quite some time that they need to do something about their board and they've held out right. for whatever reason. So I think it, that would be one scenario where I think um, this could be valuable. Um, but But I think it's really very early to say, and you look at something like proxy access that came around a few years ago and everyone was concerned about what that would mean. And how many times has that actually been used? Um, I think you'd probably count them on the finger in one hand. But um, so it'll be interesting to see what the impact is with this, right. really. Right. Yeah, we're looking out. Um, we're looking out. And Bruce, Bruce was, a, was an amazing conversation too. Um, so I guess one of, one of the last questions I have for you are, um, you know, do you think boards are doing enough, a good enough job um, in, you know, benchmarking themselves with some of their peers? And, you know, what, what should they be doing better? And, you know, what are some of the shortfalls? Right. And, and we're really talking here from a governance perspective, yeah. because I'm sure 
across the business. There's all kinds of benchmarking going on around yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> products and sales and so on. But yeah. it's interesting that benchmarking often stops at the boardroom door. <laughs> so, you know, what what could they be doing? Well, you know, when we get involved uh, with, with board evaluations, we will often benchmark the composition of the board against peers or aspirational peers or even best in class companies in some cases. Yeah. We might also look at um, board structure and process, you know, what kind of committees do your competitors have? Um, how often is the board and the committees meeting? There's quite a lot of information in the public domain that you could be looking at. And then increasingly these days, um, there's a lot of interest in, well, how are they managing ESG and sustainability from the board perspective? And could you go take a look at their disclosures about that, assuming they say something about it? which in itself is a useful thing to know. Um, and so I think benchmarking can be very valuable. And look, good corporate secretaries absolutely are doing this all the time. But, um, you know, I, I would say it's still a kind of minority interest in the board world to use benchmarking. But I actually think it's incredibly valuable. And I think Boards can learn a lot. And even if you just take composition, we've been talking about that a lot today. Understanding the kinds of people who have joined your competitors' boards and the skills and experiences they're bringing actually tells you something about their strategy. It, it maybe gives you ideas for what you should be thinking about for your own board. Um, and sometimes they might even just tell you you're way ahead, you know, and actually your board's in a better state than, than theirs is. You better believe that your investors are sort of looking at this information mm -hmm. and an activist would absolutely look at this information. Yeah. So why not you? Exactly. Uh, totally agree. Uh, keep keep tabs with, with what your peers are doing. Uh, hey, Anthony, really, really appreciate it. I guess to, to finish off, uh, what what should we be looking out for as we as we come to the end of 22 into 23? Uh, maybe one or two uh, themes or trends or or, or or topics to look out for going into next year. Yeah, look, I think a couple of things. So first of all, obviously, everyone's going to be watching the universal proxy situation and and whether that delivers anything differently than might have occurred without it. Uh, the thing I'm interested in with the Republicans capturing the House and with clearly a lot of pressure in red states against ESG, even as a concept, um, the kind of hearings we might see in Washington around uh, the impact of ESG investing um, and, you know, what does it even mean and what is it doing to companies? And I think you're going to get this clash of ideas between those who were worried about what they would call woke capitalism yeah. and those who are sitting there saying, well, hang on a minute, what we're really talking about is material risks and material opportunities for businesses that will keep them sustainable in the long term and how that unfolds and what that might do to our use of the language. You know, maybe ESG becomes so tainted that we can't talk about it anymore. Right. We have to talk about sustainability. I think boards need to be paying a lot of attention to this because they've got to tread a very narrow path here between irritating some of their stakeholders and downright dismaying their investors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, look, most sensible people would say that there's really... Um, no choice here that ESG factors have to be taken into account. If that is how modern investing is done these days. That's how every portfolio manager is being trained. Um, you know, it's it's what you will take into account in your CFA exam if you <laughs> sit. And, um, you know, it's basically everywhere and it's how business is done in 2022. You still have to take account of political stakeholders, their voters, their states, right. and think about how you're going to bring those things together. So that's something I would be watching in 2023. Cool, cool. 
we're gonna have to have you back for a for a full talk on ESG. Um, uh, maybe, maybe next year, but really, really appreciate again you taking the time. Uh, super interesting conversation. A lot of a lot of themes to follow here, and really appreciate the insights. So thanks again, Anthony. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for having me, David, and I'd love to come back. Awesome.